Good morning. Uh, welcome. Uh, I am so excited about this panel and the extraordinary panelists that we have assembled. If I can briefly introduce uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, will be coming here momentarily. He's going to slot. Yes, thank you, Prime Minister. That's the empty chair. <laughs> we have, of course, Latvian Prime Minister Christianis Kaurins with us, uh, Prime Minister Kaya Kallis of Estonia, and Admiral Rob Bauer, Chairman of the NATO Military Committee. I am going to take the moderator's prerogative. I'm going to actually change the title of this panel, and I'm going to use a quote from Prime Minister uh, Kallis that this panel is going to be entitled, entitled Defending NATO Territory from the Very First Minute. That was something that you said in May after uh, the largest NATO exercises in Estonia, spring storm, happened in May. Because it's not defending forward, it's defending every inch of NATO territory. So the Prime Ministers have given me uh, a little bit of permission that I'm actually going to first turn to Admiral Rob Bauer, uh, to give everyone a two-minute level set, and this is your challenge, Admiral, because since 2019, the military committee has been working on these regional defense plans, upwards of 4,000 pages of classified material, uh, and I, what I want him to do is just give you the two-minute description of these three regional defense plans, the, de the deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic area, and then I want to bring our prime ministers into the conversation, what this means. Um, and I, I think this panel, with all due respect to the focus, the exciting news about Sweden that the Secretary General noted today, the important information about Ukraine, this conversation about defending NATO, this generational shift in thinking, I think is the most important thing we're going to talk about today. So there you have it. You, uh, Admiral Bauer, two minutes or less, tell everyone in the audience what they need to know about these three regional defense plans. Okay. We actually now have um, the plans in place for defending our alliance every inch. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is uh, basically going back to collective defense. That is the big change. Uh, it is based on two threats, Russia and terror groups. That is also a big change, that we base our plans on threats. And therefore, we are now working towards... Uh, so the regional plans basically look at... Uh, how do you do that? How do you deter and defend against those two threats, given the geography of the different regions? High north, uh, in Europe, and in the south of Europe. And uh, so, so that, is the, that, is the, that is the practical work of the plans. Out of those plans come then a set of, require, uh, of capabilities that you actually need to do the work with, which is the airplanes, uh, the ships, the brigades, etc., etc. So that is the, the next step, that we talk about what is the set of capabilities we need in all domains, cyber, space, maritime, land and air. So the set of capabilities is the force structure requirement. The next step is then, how do you command and control these, uh, 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 these forces once we have them? And the challenge for the next couple of years is that the nations that have agreed to this in this summit, uh, to all these plans, to this four structure requirements, to the command and control adaptation, are going to do what is necessary in terms of getting more people at a higher readiness, more soldiers at a higher readiness, getting the capabilities, buying the systems that we, that we, that we need. So it is more investments. It is investments in infrastructure. It is investments in enablement of... Good morning. <coughs> It is investments in enablement to make sure that we don't, do not only have the fighting forces, but also that we are able to have the logistics in place, that we are able to, to support the fight as we now see in Ukraine is so difficult. So three regional defense plans, um, high north in the Atlantic, the central plan, which covers the Baltics to the Alps, I think is how you've described yep. it, and then Southeast Europe, yep. those three regional defense plans. Prime Minister Trudeau, welcome. Good Thank morning. You. Apologies for No, no, no. I call this perfect timing because I'm going to throw the first question uh, to you. So uh, no rest for the weary. I'm sorry. Uh, Admiral Bauer just described these, these three plans. And um, really, you just, you just arrived uh, to Vilnius from Riga, where you made, uh, I 
a historic announcement uh, about an additional 2,200 Canadian forces that will be uh, in Latvia, a 2.6 billion Canadian dollar contribution. So w this obviously has huge implications for Canada's role along the eastern flank, but the regional defense plans also have implications for Canada in the high north and the North Atlantic, uh, a huge area of protection for Canada. Help us understand what these regional defense plans will mean for Canada, and how do you as Prime Minister you know, convey this to your citizens, how important this is to their security? Well, I think one of the things that our, our citizens across all our countries are, are understanding right now is the world is changing and not necessarily in reassuring ways. Uh, the aggressive posture, not just of Russia in its invasion of Ukraine, uh, but uh, the rise of, of authoritarian powers that are uh, trying to push the limits of the rules-based order, uh, challenge in every function that they can, um, you know, try and make might right once again, um, means we have to be absolutely unequivocal in standing up. Uh, for them and bringing our citizens along. There's no question that in Canada, like everywhere, um, inflation's a challenge, housing prices a challenge, labor shortages are a challenge, the hangovers from the pandemic, worries about climate change. There's so many things going on that additioning to this geopolitical instability as something we also have to step up and spend, and spend on um, requires explaining but not that much explaining. Canadians understand deeply how uh, if Russia is successful in redrawing lines on a map in Ukraine, uh, then uh, everything else around the world becomes more dangerous and more destabilized. And uh, people are now fully convinced that what happens on the other side of the world does have an impact on them. So uh, Canadians have been extremely supportive of the close to $8 billion that we've invested in military, financial, uh, and uh, humanitarian support to Ukraine over the past uh, past short while. Uh, and they're also very enthusiastic about what I was announcing with uh, Christianis yesterday, uh, which, as you say, is a doubling of the Canadian contingent in Latvia as we move towards brigade side along with, uh, along with others. Because holding and strengthening NATO's eastern flank uh, against Russia is unbelievably important. Uh, but just last summer, I was up in uh, Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, which is uh, one of our more northern communities, uh, with uh, Jens Stoltenberg uh, to talk about uh, the, the posture around the Arctic and how Canada is continuing to make investments uh, in not just in military in the Arctic, but in Arctic sovereignty, which for us goes through the people who live in the Arctic. Uh, infrastructure, communities, uh, economic opportunities, uh, protection of the climate, presence, and active use of uh, Canada's Arctic as uh, part of how we're gonna make sure that as unfortunately the Arctic becomes a more and more accessible uh, theater of operations or of of uh, interference or of exploitation, uh, Canada and other Nordic countries are very much uh, connected. I say other Nordic countries because a couple of weeks ago I was in Iceland with uh, the Nordic Council uh, talking at great length about what we were going to do to continue to work together to protect our Arctic. But the world is changing. Canadians get that. And I think people throughout the alliance as citizens understand how, uh, how we need to step up, as, uh, as Rob was pointing out. Absolutely. Prime Minister Kersh, I'd love to hear from your perspective. Obviously, this is an incredibly welcome announcement. Um, um, what are the challenges very specifically for Latvia, integrating Latvian national defense plans into NATO defense plans? Admiral Bauer, I think that is really one of the key challenges of, of these regional defense plans. Um, and is Latvia sort of struggling a little bit as, as Lithuania has with the hosting of these additional forces, you have to provide that needed infrastructure. Would welcome your thoughts on how citizens are, are welcoming this news. Well, uh, citizens in Latvia are very welcoming. The only uh, uh, disagreement with Canada is occasionally on the ice hockey rink, but uh, okay. otherwise, there's uh, no. There, there, there really, is, it's it's understood the the Canadian commitment, and now the additional commitment is uh, very appreciated. But remember, in our country the development of our also thinking about defense. So prior to uh, 2016, when uh, Russia, uh, with the special operations, uh, annexed uh, Crimea, I think there was a, a general thinking, not only in my country, but uh, in many NATO countries, that it's sort of a, a real attack and, and 
territorial defense is maybe not the number one priority. Since uh, uh, 2016, uh, all, all of that uh, has changed. So we have the uh, Baltic air policing. The Canadians came in with the EFP. The EFP today has 11 NATO countries. And the Canadian uh, leadership has cracked the nut of making 11 different armies actually be able to work together, units from, from different militaries. Everyone is in the same standard, but when it comes down to practicalities, you know, people are speaking different languages, um, different procedures to get all of that working. Now, Canadians do diversity well. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And now what they're doing is they're, the, the, the nut that has been cracked, they're basically doubling the size of that nut. Uh, so it's, it's an order of magnitude, not necessarily a new challenge. Now, from our side, uh, we have uh, uh, regionally, I think it's uh, still the largest uh, military base in Adish in Latvia. We have approved, uh, uh, appointed money, and the laws have been passed uh, for a new training area, uh, 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 a fifth or sixth training area in Latvia, which will be more than twice the size of the existing one and actually larger than all the other bases combined, some 25,000 uh, square uh, kilometers. It's, it's a, a huge, uh, uh, maybe I got that number wrong. Well, you can find it uh, uh, in, on the website at any rate. <laughs> but it's a huge uh, training area. So we're making all the investments to host everyone because uh, also we've reintroduced uh, uh, the, consc the conscription in our military. Uh, our defense spending, we were planning on hitting 3% in 2027. Now we've moved forward uh, uh, with the conscription, with a purchase of uh, air defense, with purchase of uh, uh, coastal defense, and with advanced purchase of the rocket artillery, the HIMARS systems. My finance ministry says we could hit 3% next year uh, of defense spending. So we have really up the game in terms of what we're doing ourselves. The Canadians are, of course, uh, 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 taking a great leadership position here, and we will have additional training areas. So it's, it's sort of doing everything that we've been doing for the past five, six years, and doing it on a grander scale. And pressing the foot down on the accelerator, absolutely. Um, Prime Minister Kallis, um, as I mentioned, uh, Estonia has a 183-mile border with Russia. You've been exceptionally articulate and outspoken about NATO's laser-like focus on, on, on defense. Um, in May, uh, Spring Storm, uh, which was the largest NATO exercise in Estonia's um, history, I mean, how does these enhanced regionally strong regional defense plans what are the impact for estonia would you like to see a larger british presence there we had uh, obviously the uk had 1500 forces for that exercise do you want to see a more beefed up physical presence what do you think is missing if anything what are the challenges that estonia faces with integrating these forces yeah first of all i i must say that i'm i'm super happy that we got so strong decisions in madrid and now we have the plans that are actually uh, the implementation of those decisions but uh, uh, what we need to do is is that our our forces are combat ready. Uh, I mean, the allied forces integrated with our own national forces. The plans are all about that, how that functions, pre-positioned equipment, you know, more ammunition. But it, what, what, what it comes down to is uh, that uh, where uh, are the plans only on paper or are they really, uh, you know, doable and, and implemented in real life? And that comes down to the defense spending that the, all the allies are doing. And when I was looking up the figures, it was interesting to see that in 1988, all the allies, all the uh, NATO's allies invested 2% of their GDP to defense. And why? Because the threat was real. The Cold War uh, and, and the threat was real. And now uh, 11 uh, allies are doing that. And, and uh, I, I, I have the feeling that uh, maybe there is no such understanding to everybody or, or um, that the threat is real and even more real as we have a conventional war going on. So what we really have to do is, is boost our own defense spending and that means also uh, giving assurances to the uh, defense industry to boost their production because what we see here, I mean they talk about the 
uh, cluster ammunition, uh, it is related to not having other things to give. Um, so, so in order to be really um, ready to defend ourselves, we really have to fulfill those plans with the war fighting capabilities and, and be uh, combat ready um, uh, in case it's needed. And it is all necessary for it to be never needed because then it acts as a deterrence when it's credible. You've actually advocated for uh, NATO thinking about a new floor for defense spending at 2.5% or even higher. Do you think that's where NATO needs to press all members? Of course, the Wales commitment uh, will be uh, honored next year at the Washington summit that uh, uh, 2% does it need to be higher to fulfill these plans? I'll ask Just, that to I you, mean, Admiral. Of course, every ally uh, decides uh, themselves and, and uh, it is already, if, if everybody would do this 2%, that would be already a great deal. I would just, you know, illustrate this. I mean, the period from 99 to 2021, uh, all the European allies of NATO uh, increased their inf investment in defense by 23.9%. Um, and the uh, U.S., the same period, 65.7. And now Russia, the same period of time, 292%. And China, the same period of time, 592% increase. So, so uh, the point is that uh, the threat is real and, and we have to do more. And, and one more um, historical fact. In 1933... The uh, investment spending in defense uh, in Estonia was record low because there was no political support. You know, you have other things, uh, investing in education, social affairs, you know, all the worries that you have, domestic problems. And in 1939, it was clear that you, you know, have to boost the investment in defense, but it was already too late. It's not like with COVID that we can react when the problem is here and we can get our act together and react then, but we have to really prepare in advance so that we would not uh, find ourselves in this situation. Admiral Bauer, I think two questions for me. I mean, do we need the, the capabilities that are required to implement these regional defense plans? To, is spending on track? And, and there's a time horizon here. As you yourself have said, this is going to take many, several years. The exercises, the personnel, the capabilities. Do we have that time? What, how do you manage that? And then I'm going to turn and talk a little bit about Ukraine and, and the implications there. For I think uh, I, I fully agree with uh, Prime Minister Kalas. Uh, time is of the essence here. Uh, after we have agreed, the leaders have agreed uh, to, the, to the plans. Uh, and that's great news because it is historic uh, that we now have for, uh, for the first time in many, many decades real plans for uh, changed and much better plans for collective defense. So, but it starts now with doing what we need to do. And, 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 and that's what I said. It is the investments. It is, so it's, it's not only about the money. The money is necessary to be able to invest. But it's also about more personnel, doing uh, the right sort of exercises, tri uh, exercising against those plans. No fictitious scenarios anymore. Uh, we talk about Russia as a threat in, in the scenarios. And so we need to do all these things as soon as possible. But it will take time because recruiting more soldiers, building infrastructure, uh, and it's not only in defense, it's also military mobility in Europe. It's still a problem. Uh, that, that it's not easy to move things through Europe if it comes to the military and ammunition. And in a war you want to move ammunition as food through Europe. And it's not easy. It's still a lot of restrictions. So we need together to feel the urgency to actually make it work. And it's not only about the money. It is, there's a lot of work to be done. And it starts tomorrow after the decision, after the summit. We all have to start doing what is necessary to make it work. And, and it, it, it will be difficult and it will take time because it is not a switch, it is a, it is a path from where we are to where we need to go. There is a little bit of time, that's the good news, because the Russians are not as good as they were when they started the war. So we have a bit of time because the plans are based on the strength of the Russians when the war started. So if they reconstitute to that position, we're still in a good position with our plans. But we need to do everything that is necessary. And Prime Minister Carlos talked about the industry that is a serious issue still, that we have to find the, the right people to connect and to make sure there is 
the money becomes available for investments that they start to invest and to make larger production facilities. It is, it is simple as that. I know you've been working since 2019, but the work begins today, and that exactly. urgency, that's the clear message. Prime Minister Trudeau, I'd like to change uh, slightly, but it's the same thing. I, foreign, uh, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba wrote in Foreign Policy a few days ago, he was making an argument that let's not think what NATO can do for Ukraine as we contemplate the packages, but what Ukraine can do for NATO. And he was suggesting that an, a Ukrainian brigade is going to be defending NATO's eastern flank, a hardened, capable Ukrainian military. Are we not thinking sufficiently about how the Ukrainian military, when they are in NATO, will actually be a huge additive to protecting NATO's eastern flank? And I really would love your reflections as we go down the panel, and then I'm going to add a second part to that. We've witnessed an extraordinary extraordinary historical moment within Russia the last two weeks. Progozin's mutiny, we're still trying to ascertain what that means. But the shift in Belarus, does this now start arguing for different thinking uh, along the eastern flank? Because Belarus now with Russian tactical nuclear weapons, we may have Wagner very much engaged in Belarus. Does this change any thinking? Please. Well, first, in regards to, to Ukraine, when uh, Russia invaded Crimea uh, in 2014, Canada was uh, one of the countries that decided to step up right away and start training uh, the Ukrainian military. Uh, and uh, from 2015 onwards, uh, we trained up till the beginning of the war, about 35,000 uh, members of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, and since then uh, have only stepped up. I was actually just meeting with some uh, Canadian uh, military trainers in Latvia who are doing a, a senior officer and a, a middle officer corps uh, training exercise in, uh, in Latvia and uh, for Ukrainians. And what we've seen is, yes, uh, we all knew that a large Soviet-style army gets to defeat a smaller Soviet-style army, but the Russians who have a large Soviet-style army now are not able to defeat what was a small Soviet-style army in Ukraine, but is now actually a modern equipped, but more importantly, modern trained uh, military. And the way they're using uh, the officer corps, the way they are actually um, you know, smarter about modern warfare has been a huge part of uh, that holding off of the Russian, Russian effectiveness. But the really interesting thing that I've talked with uh, our trainers about is even as they are you know, training up on all sorts of advanced tactical and, and strategic uh, points and equipment use, the immediate feedback from the Ukrainian fighters and, and leaders who are testing this right away on the battlefield, who are seeing how they work in different tactics, who are giving a, a, a fresh perspective on very strong theory has been an incredible symbiosis. And what we are learning and drawing on uh, from this very uh, real um, war that's going on right now is feeding in not just our need to, as Rob said, continue to step up on more ammunition, on more procurement, on, on better preparation for what's next, but actually understanding what is most impactful and effective. And there's a, a, an expression that everyone's always preparing the equipment they wish they'd had in the last conflict instead of looking towards the next one. And that's where the hybrid warfare, the disinformation, the misinformation, the, cy the cyber capacities, all the different things that are coming together, even responding to the ecocide that was the, the destruction of the dam. Um, these kinds of things are coloring everything we do and everything we have to think about about what could be coming next. Absolutely. Prime Minister Karas, how, how do you feel about Ukraine being an additive to your defense? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, 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 as Justin was saying, today we're training uh, Ukrainians uh, and uh, I'm convinced that tomorrow they'll be training us uh, yeah. because which army uh, in Europe has now the experience of actually fighting the Russians? It is the Ukrainians, and uh, they're learning, um, and they're, they're, they're surprisingly, or maybe not so surprising, they're fantastically adaptable to all kinds of weapon systems. I imagine the complexity, they're getting all kinds of different equipment, and they're able to train up to use many different. So within our own armies, you know, you, get, you have one 
type of system and everyone learns that one type of system. They're adapting to all the different systems that we have, which is actually a challenge in terms of simplicity of platforms that we have to think about in NATO. Uh, but uh, they will be uh, eventually training us. Um, but the, the point of, of NATO and, and, and Ukraine's future role in NATO is uh, remember that Russia only understands strength and power. And the reason they're fighting the war in Ukraine is because they wrongly but perceived Ukraine as being weak and an easy target because it was in the gray area of not in NATO. Uh, so uh, NATO's uh, 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 value add is, of course, our preparedness and the fact that Russia understands uh, that preparedness. Now, regarding Belarus, uh, we in Latvia have been it's two years now that we have uh, uh, daily experience with the hybrid, mm. hybrid attacks physically on our borders. So uh, the, the Belarusian government organizes planes full of people from third countries and physically moves them to the border, uh, tries and sometimes succeeds in cutting the fences and uh, encouraging, if not forcing people to uh, illegally enter into the European Union. So they have effectively help us to train ourselves to have a seamless interaction between the border guard police and the uh, national guard uh, uh, with surveillance etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, where we're fully aware of this so the threat is very real um, the threat of disinformation the threat of cyber uh, israel in latvia we have the uh, the, the Stratcom Center of Excellence in Estonia, it's the, it's the cyber, uh, and it's maybe no coincidence that in our countries we have these uh, two centers. These are very real threats. But with Wagner coming into, or potentially coming into Belarus, I don't think that anyone seriously thinks that even five or 6,000 soldiers would now be a direct military threat uh, to uh, NATO. But imagine even 500 uh, well-trained, uh, ruthless mercenaries um, attempting the, uh, the migrant uh, route. And what would they do uh, if they came uh, into Europe? Uh, so our awareness on the border in Latvia, in, in Lithuania, in, in uh, Poland, uh, all of our services, they're in constant contact and observing the groups who tend to try one place, then another, then a third place. So there's very well situational awareness on our side, but we need to keep that heightened because that threat is not going anywhere. And with Prigozhin and, and uh, if anyone thinks that, oh, uh, Putin is now weak, uh, maybe on some level, uh, that is, if there are two bulldogs fighting and one is weaker, it doesn't mean the other one is a poodle. It means the other one is still a bulldog. Uh, and uh, we're not expecting uh, any uh, lessening of the threat. Uh, so we don't see anything changing in Russia, shall we say, for the better. Uh, so that means that on our side, literally on our side of the fence, uh, we have to uh, up, up the game of preparedness uh, and, uh, and just keep our eyes open. And, and I think all of our eyes, uh, not only us in the Baltics, uh, but uh, all of our eyes are now open. Absolutely. Prime Minister Kallas. Actually, I, I don't have a lot to add. Uh, I mean, uh, it was already uh, said by previous speakers. I would just add one thing. Um, I mean, uh, reading uh, uh, about the NATO um, enlargement and when the Visegrad countries were accepted to uh, NATO, then one of the German representatives, and I don't remember uh, who uh, exactly it was, uh, said that um, uh, it would be... Uh, Let's accept the Poles because uh, Poland because it would be so much better when the Poles are fighting for us and not the Germans. And actually, uh, that could be the same uh, quote right now. I mean, the Ukraines, uh, Ukrainians are fighting uh, for us uh, so that uh, the Americans, uh, Canadians, Latvians, Estonians don't have to do that. So uh, that's why I think the point that you made, um, uh, that they bring something to the table and as... Uh, 
Gershani said, I mean, they have the only, uh, they are the only army that has actual experience of fighting the Russians right now. That is the biggest threat. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, welcome any questions. There's a microphone right in the middle. So I'm going to have you line up uh, at that microphone right in the middle. Uh, and please introduce yourself. We have a quick 10 minutes. I'm going to, while you're getting making your way to the microphone, we're getting a lot of questions about this balance about China and the Russia challenge. Uh, and in fact, there was one question, Prime Minister Trudeau, to you that as Canada is obviously now uh, really increasing its presence in Latvia along the eastern flank, can it, does it have the defense resources to be able to manage the threat uh, towards the North Pacific? So we're going to take those, the four, I, I see three colleagues, uh, really rapid, I mean rapid fire so we can get uh, uh, turned back to the panel. So Ziggy, please, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Zygis Pavilon is former ambassador in Washington, D.C. Uh, of Lithuania. Maybe one question to Prime Minister Trudeau. You know, in Europe, we are more or less united on making a clear path for Ukrainians' NATO membership. But we have a problem in Washington. Why don't you, as you know, neighbors of uh, Americans, help us in Washington for, May, for them not to make the same mistake as we did in Bucharest altogether? Because if we do that mistake today in Vilnius, Baltics could be in trouble. Thank you, Ziki. Um, Olena Halushka, International Center for Ukrainian Victory. It will be very complicated for me to put my question after Mr. Pabilionis, but I also have the question to Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, that's the question basically from 40 millions of Ukrainians uh, and uh, Canada as a very strong supporter uh, of Ukraine, um, which has always been, um, will you support Ukraine's uh, invitation to NATO at the Vilnius summit? And will you help us to use this last hours before the final decision is made to convince those governments which are reluctant to make this historic yet very important move, particularly the US and Germany? Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to take one more question. I apologize. We're going to have to end on time, sir. We'll take your question. Uh, good morning. Carlos Bukowski is from the Latvian Institute of National Affairs. Um, I'm going to ask a question, um, which in this case probably is more of a citizen's question, uh, to Prime Minister Kallas, and you, in this case, echoed something that uh, the uh, Secretary General already mentioned before in the morning about the provi uh, providing cluster bombs to, uh, to Ukraine, as this is the last ammunition that we have to provide. So my provocative question is, doesn't that send a little bit of message that NATO has no ammunition left anymore, so that we're sending the last one and this is the last one? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I would certainly encourage everyone to ask U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan some of those questions that you were asking uh, the panel later today. But Prime Minister Trudeau, and we have about eight minutes left. Let me just go down the row, if I may. Clearly, Ukraine uh, and the message that the summit will deliver is top of everyone's minds. We'll have uh, that and any ammunition and sort of, again, that defense production issue that's going to keep coming back. But we'll begin and then we'll just work our way down. Canada has been unequivocal from the very beginning on support of Ukraine, and not just because we have the uh, largest Ukrainian diaspora outside of Russia uh, in Canada and have for about 100, uh, 100 plus years uh, been welcoming Ukrainians to settle our prairies, but also because Canadians understand that standing up against Russia here uh, is standing up against any country with a slightly larger army that has designs on its neighbor's territory, uh, which would lead to uh, chaos and destabilization around the world. So uh, as a matter of principle and a matter of friendship, Canadians are absolutely firm on our support of Ukraine, including uh, on welcoming in uh, Ukraine to NATO uh, when the conditions allow. Uh, and that's what I said a few weeks ago uh, when I was with uh, Volodymyr Zelensky in, in Kyiv. Uh, and that's certainly what we're uh, talking about here. Uh, I know that is not a unanimously held position uh, amongst NATO, but I also know uh, that there has been a lot of really substantive discussion to get to a place where there is a clear path uh, for for Ukraine uh, because Ukrainians as they fight are asking themselves, okay, how does this end and how do we make sure this doesn't start again, even if we win now or even if we stop now, what's to prevent four years from now a rearmed Russia, Russia from trying again and not missing it this time. And that is uh, making sure there's a clear path into NATO and I think I'm 
fairly confident that where we're going to get here in this meeting will give that clear uh, support to, uh, to Ukrainians so that they know uh, there, is, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Thank you. Prime Minister Karns. Uh, the, the same question uh, on Ukraine. Um, well, for me, it, it seems very simple. Uh, we want uh, peace uh, in Europe, and there's two ways to have that. One very theoretical, that something massively changes in Russia. I'm not holding my breath. Uh, the second is to um, get rid of the gray areas and make it very clear to Russia where, uh, where, uh, 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 um, where their limit is, and that is uh, NATO. So only when Ukraine will be in NATO will we uh, be able to have a, a stable uh, peace. It's not a complete peace because Russia will still be there, Russia will still be a threat, but it's only then. So it, to, to me, it seems very obvious this has to be uh, the exit uh, of this conflict, that uh, a, an independent, a liberated uh, Ukraine uh, becomes uh, a member of NATO, the only way for a stable peace. Prime Minister, what would your message be to President Biden on this question? Well, we have been sending those messages and, and we are, um, are talking about these things. I think uh, fundamentally we have the same view. And again, I mean, going back to Clinton and Gore, who said that we, uh, when the uh, NATO was enlarging, that we can't leave Ukraine out in the cold with the furry neighbor uh, besides uh, um, them. So um, I think we have uh, uh, the obligation. But as uh, uh, Justin said, uh, for us, it is very important that, uh, that we have the path, we have concrete steps that we agree uh, how this is going to happen. Uh, we understand that uh, it can't uh, you know, happen uh, while the war is going on, but, uh, but concrete steps by moving closer to, I mean, uh, steps like uh, like uh, having this constant review, uh, seeing that uh, you know the uh, systems are interoperable, all the things that we can do, and when the opportunity window opens, uh, then we can do this in order to stop this. Because I'm of the belief that uh, that the only security guarantee that is the cheapest and that really works uh, is uh, NATO's membership. I mean, our our countries are a living example of it. Now, coming to the question that was directly addressed to me, uh, then of course we have uh, our stocks, uh, uh, we have enough to defend our countries. We all do. I mean, we give what we can give so that we are not uh, left uh, defenseless. Uh, uh, and this is all the talk, I mean, because uh, uh, it is all the talk about what we can give uh, so that we don't let our guard down, because the threat is still real. Um, so, uh, and, and having I mean, that we have given so much, uh, then it also ha has to come from somewhere. And then it comes to the production that hasn't really um, doubled or tripled while we are giving everything away and ordering uh, new things. And the production or the procurement uh, deadlines are way too long. So how can we really shorten those? And I totally agree. It's not about the money, but what we do with the money and, and where we invest the money. Uh, I mean, the collective defense, uh, uh, thinking about defense regionally, not every country, you know, their own, but, but uh, like we do with Latvians. We have agreed that, you know, uh, our threats can go uh, come through through Latvia. So so that means that uh, you know our forces uh, uh, can uh, also be protecting and defending uh, Latvia. Uh, and and that's why I mean uh, one thing is helping Ukraine, and the other thing is also uh, boosting our own defense. Absolutely, Admiral Bauer. I'm going to uh, provoke and say honestly, there's free uh, four regional defense plans. Ukraine, in many ways, is its uh, NATO's regional defense plan as we strengthen their military capabilities, as we train them, as we create uh, and help support uh, their uh, their quest to liberate their territory. How do you, moving from this day forward, with those regional defense plans in place, all the work that you have to do, how much are you adapting to Russia's reconstitution? And they are learning on the battlefield as well. How much are these regional defense plans living in response to Russia's adaptation of its military? 
Yeah, it's a, living, it's a living document, these plans, and I think everybody needs to understand that if the threat changes, then we will adapt those plans, and then we will have to respond uh, to, to the change. And, uh, and that is what we will continue to do. As I said, and that is important, uh, the plans are now based on the threat that was Russia before they started the war, the full-fledged war in Ukraine on 24th of February 2022. So I think we are, for now, we're good. If, uh, if, if, if we do what we have agreed in the plans, so it is now to all the nations that they have to implement the changes, invest in the capabilities, get more people, be readier, because otherwise it, it, it still doesn't work. Uh, if the Russians will reconstitute and in certain areas will become bigger, better than they were, then we will respond to that. As I said, this is the most important part of the NATO summit you may not hear as much about, but this is where we defend every inch of NATO territory. With your applause, would you please kindly thank our wonderful panelists for a great discussion.